influence to just lobbying through the interagency process, which would be, a, you know, sort of the standard way to do it. And something in the American case that I'm kind of, int- I don't know, interested is, is a cold way of saying, like, potentially deeply concerned about. But <laughs> so one thing that can happen is that social divisions kind of seep their way into the military, right? Or the military becomes reflective or part of these kind of broader culture and political wars. Um, the French Third Republic is a good example where the military kind of, or at least parts of it were aligned with the right versus the left, highly polarized. And I worry a little bit that as the U.S. has become incredibly politically polarized and as the American military officer corps has become pretty heavily Republican, I don't know the statistics, but that's, you know, kind of disproportionately Republican, you get into a world not where there would be a coup, but where let's say a Democrat comes into office and the military leadership kind of looks at that person. And I mean, some of this happened with Clinton a little bit. and It's like, huh, you know, Trump was problematic, but this person is problematic in different ways. And what kind of options for slow rolling things, for kind of t- using Congress to to block the president, for kind of bureaucratic processes, then kick in, where you get a different kind of dynamic. Um, that's something that, you know, I don't want to catastrophize about, but at least it's something to pay attention to if political polarization in the U.S. continues and is manifested in some ways within the, the leadership of the U.S. military. We'll be back after this short break. Chicago, the Windy City, the city of broad shoulders, the second city is complicated. Known for its legacies of segregation and political corruption, Chicago has a lot to grapple with. On Chicagoland, we bring you conversations with activists, journalists, politicians, and others who are working to address these issues. You can find Chicagoland wherever you listen to podcasts. From University of Chicago Public Policy Podcasts, this is Chicagoland. What do you think the future of CivMill around the rest of the world looks like? Where are the trends going? Okay, uh, I don't have an answer to that, but let me tell you some trends, okay. right? Um, one that is different than the classic coup model is going back to, so I talked about there are these two extremes. One is kind of the military breaks loose and goes rogue, but the other is regimes bring militaries to heel and use them in part as domestic political tools. I worry more about that latter kind of the global level as we think about democratic erosion, the rise of populism. Uh, kind of different kinds of digital authoritarianism, those regimes have the military as one of their political tools, both symbolically, right, as a symbol of the nation that also supports the regime, and sometimes also as kind of a backstop to preserve the regime in the face of domestic unrest, right? Think of Tiananmen, right, and and dynamics like that where the military gets sent into the streets, or even just the threat of the military hangs in the background, right, and influences how protesters think. And I think you know, we've seen in cases like Egypt what happens when a military really decides to crush civilian opposition to its rule um, in very bloody and dramatic fashion. So I worry places like Turkey, places like China, um, that these dynamics kind of have made the military less of a rogue actor and more of a, a pawn of regimes. Um, so that's one thing. I also, to, to argue against myself, there was this book that was published, I don't know, in 2000 or something. Um, it was an edited volume that was like the decline of the role of the military in Asia. Right. And it was basically this like, look, coups are going away and everything is fine. So there is, however, a trend of militaries reasserting themselves, at least in Asia and the Middle East or parts of the Middle East, like, you know, Egypt being the classic case. And in Asia, we've seen military coups in Bangladesh in two th- or kind of a weird quasi coup in 2007 in Pakistan in 1999. But still, even after the military has withdrawn, it's still very important as a political actor. Same in Burma or Myanmar, Indonesia. It's kind of creeping back in right after it looked like we'd seen kind of full and formal democratization. And so we're seeing these cases that are not maybe the classic kind of strongman coups of the Cold War, but in which militaries have managed to preserve some degree of autonomy and political influence and are still very much in the political game, even if they're not directly ruling. So those are kind of one. The first is the military becomes a pawn of a authoritarian or illiberal democratic regime. The second is the military, you know, is still hanging around and it's doing things, it's tilting the playing field in ways that are worrisome for democracy. My thinking about the future, you know, subject to the same caveats that Paul gave, which which is this is an incomplete um, forecast. But one thing I thought would be interesting to think about, or I think it's interesting interesting to think about, is how the way warfare is changing might affect the relationship between the civilian and military um, institutions in different countries. And so, you know, sort of in, in in the sort of zone of my own research, you know, a lot of people are drawing attention to behavior by Russia, behavior by China. Um, and, you know, the American sort of migration towards, um, special operations, 
where it's whether you call it hybrid warfare or gray zone conflict, both of which I'd appreciate if we just flush down the toilet. But <laughs> um, but it said you just use both of them. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, with, with yeah with instructions. Um, <laughs> But whatever you want to call it, what is interesting is, you know, you look at like the, the Wagner group with, um, with the Russians. You look at these sort of like maritime patrols by, not by, uh, the people, you know, not by the Chinese Navy, but by sort of like a merchant marine or so. So you have a shift towards unacknowledged or, um, sort of commercially or, or privatized ways of using, uh, engaging in military activities or using military force. Well, what does that do for, civil military relations and is the sort of the systemic and technological trends that are pushing warfare away from traditional conventional conflict uh, at least that's my view uh, as as part of the causes of that is that going to have some sort of unintended sort of spillover effects where you're now engaging in war or military activities in a different way and then that doesn't those activities are no longer governed by the same norms and political structures that um, that manage um, um, traditional military operations. And this goes back to this Niger point, right? The U.S. has military forces all over the world doing all kinds of stuff, right? It's hard. I think most citizens don't really have a great sense of where and what those activities are. Members of Congress don't either. So what what does that do for accountability, oversight, also accountability and responsibility on the part of civilians, right? It's their job to be keeping an eye on what's going on and making sure the military is being used appropriately and service members are not being put in undue risk. So it's this dual kind of responsibility. So I worry about that along the lines that Austin's talking about. Kind of going in the other direction, I simultaneously worry as we kind of ramp up kind of the, the new era of great power competition, we're getting into some pretty wild and crazy stuff, especially in the Pacific, where you have mass, you know, highly lethal military forces that can unleash extraordinary amounts of lethality in a very short period of time. You're kind of competing with china you've got especially as we move toward missiles ground launch cruise missiles possibly like things are just going to look really wild and crazy as these military forces get built up in the western pacific and that gets you into all kinds of kind of cold war era questions as well like who's in charge of responding to provocations how does escalation happen who manages that and if things go horribly wrong like how do you de-escalate right how much authority do you delegate to to theater commanders or even local commanders what happens when missiles start flying you've got you know two minutes to make decisions about what you do next so there's this i think we actually face this really complicated threat environment where on the one hand we've got mercenaries proxy war gray zone special forces fifth generation whatever but then we've also got like we're gonna be building hypersonic missiles and like doing crazy stuff at kind of the high-end conventional bleeding into implications for nuclear strategic stability at the same time within the same military establishment instead of security competitions so, like, that's a little bit worrisome. Yeah. And I think one of the, the things that I learned from doing research on the sort of sustained covert military operations over multiple years in potentially explosive conflict environments is that, A, I, I came into it and left it convinced that escalation dynamics are very tricky, are driven by a range of, of variables um, and dynamics that can be difficult to control. And that's clearly comes across in, the, in my first book as, as a concern. Uh, but B, that um, maintaining uh, limited war is hard to do, and it requires this kind of unifi- unification of activity and action on the ground and decisions up at the way up at the top. And to Paul's point about delegation in the field and, and sort of tactical military authority, and you know, the thing I saw time and again is is leaders struggling to maintain control over the kinds of operations that were taking place, either overt or covert, uh, because there is this, um, there's this temptation, uh, when you're trying to win a war to do what you can to win. And that is sometimes in conflict with the restraints that you need to keep a crisis as a crisis or a limited conflict as a limited conflict. And so when I think about East Asia security competition, uh, competition involving China and the United States, some kind of hypersonic missile crisis or something, those kinds of scenarios, I think the, the, the sort of hand in hand relationship between civilian and military is going to be important to the extent that those need, if we want to keep those limited. And just to kind of, I mean, one thing to add here is, so, so there's basically this problem of civilian oversight, right? You want it, but you don't want too much of it. Okay. And one area in which militaries say, look, this is our sovereign domain is, is actual operational plans for war fighting, like how we are going to kind of put lethal, force on particular targets in particular ways. And civilians often don't know anything about these topics or not much. 
and they trust the militaries and militaries have much more credibility in this domain and they should because they're the professionals, right? But you can get this mismatch where civilians don't really know what would happen in the early stages of a crisis or a war. The military has its plans and they're very technical and, you know, we're going to be ranging such and such, you know, sorting this and whatnot. And they're like, trust us, we're, we're, we're military professionals. And civilians are like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Okay. And then all of a sudden stuff starts happening and civilians start to either realize their options are more constrained than they'd realized, right? Or they realize that things are happening that might be slipping out of their control. So actually to take this to a non-US case, um, in India, the, the military is under tight civilian control. But basically, since India lost the 1962 war with China, there's been a norm that the military is in charge of war fighting. All right. And so the critique has emerged, at least among some scholars, that Indian civilian policymakers don't actually know enough about what their military is, what their military is able to do and, and would do in a crisis situation because they've kind of ceded the operational, the kind of hard military side of war to the military so as not to be seen as overly meddling, so as not to be seen as excessively interventionist like happened in 1962. And so there are some, I mean, I guess this is just kind of a pitch for civilians trying to understand military dynamics, right? Not to be metally like Lyndon Johnson in the basement, you know, picking places to strike with air power, but at least have some sense of what militaries do, how they talk, what options are available, what capabilities these militaries have, because otherwise you can get at some really hairy dynamics very quickly. As we talk about those dynamics in both of your areas of research, what do you make of the, I guess, the rise of cyber warfare and its murky relationship with traditional war well i'm still fairly new to cyber and and i often t I've, I've done a few events um and participated in some conversations and i always start with the i'm the idiot in the room but i can tell you about the covert stuff you know the covert the covert aspect of it you know to me the you know the main thing that i would emphasize is that i think there is a very clear distinction between kinetic effects and you know cyber disruption or cyber attacks and that you know, as wild a west, uh, as wild west feeling as, as it has in, in the cyber domain. And I really think there are, there's tons of ambiguity, uh, and sort of experience to be gained in the sort of, uh, intra cyber space, um, uh, rules of the game, basically. I take a measure of, of optimism from the fact that I think that there is just something so intuitively clear about the difference between cyber and traditional conventional military or, cyber with kinetic effects and that i think those distinctions are um are ones that states grasp and leaders grasp and and the adversary of those leaders grasps and so um i tend to be a non-alarmist when it comes to what the sort of larger strategic consequences of cyber competition are now that is not to say that it's really not important to to compete in that space that that the rules of the game within that space need to be fleshed out that dynamics of attribution and exposure and and oversight for that matter of of um cyber operations by the united states isn't really important but it is to me uh, important to sort of step back and say the new shiny tool in the shed isn't necessarily like the end-all be-all and 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 there are important reasons i think it won't necessarily get out of hand uh, even if it escalates within that space yeah i don't know anything about cyber so that that all <laughs> sounded perfectly plausible to me but you know i i operated a much lower tech set of questions so I got nothing. So we've mentioned worries about uh, conventional warfare and escalation and what we do once operations actually begin. We've mentioned worries also on the other side as the lines of war get blurred and there's this more hybrid warfare going on. Another thing that a lot of people are worrying about or at least hesitant about is this U.S. peace deal with the Taliban going on right now. Uh, and the Afghan government has largely been sidelined from those negotiations I'm curious what your take on the situation is, whether you think we should expect stability from this. Uh, should we expect stability? Probably not. It's possible. So so let me give you a good case and then kind of a more likely case. So a good case is we cut a deal with the Taliban, but we engage in conditionality where we say, look, you know, you guys need to do these things or else we'll stop withdrawing or we'll go back to, you know, military operations under the pressure of the American withdrawal, the Kabul government kind of is willing to make a deal. The Taliban see they've got the Islamic State rising as kind of a radical alternative. The Pakistanis and the Chinese and the Russians and whoever else kind of help shepherd this through. And you get some kind of rough power sharing deal of some sort that kind of holds together. So that's, you know, it's possible. I think that's the, that's the goal. Right. It is noteworthy, though, that the U.S. so far based on the leaks. And so we don't really know what's going on, but is really emphasizing kind of 
U.S. withdrawal and Taliban assurances about Al Qaeda or ISIS operations. And everything else is kind of like, well, you know, that'll come next and we'll see what happens. So you could imagine a world in which the U.S. starts to withdraw. Trump just wants to get out. And so he's not willing to engage in conditionality of any sort. The Taliban. 